Thanks very much for having me. So I actually was going to talk a bit more broadly um, in this part of it. And then if we want, to, if anyone wants to share some case studies later, I'm more than happy to. But um, I think just to say um, thank you for the introduction. I think today I just want to provide some kind of practical advice about really how you can really think about the diversity and inclusion elements of your recruitment processes. But to be really clear, I'm not doing it from a place to sell you our service, to give you a commercial for who we are, and to say the only way you can do this is using a head hunter and they'll fix it all. Because for one thing, that's not true, because actually a lot of this and what makes for the really successful appointments is going to be what comes from you. And it's great to hear all the commitments already. And I think you'll probably hear some of the themes coming through actually in what I say. Um, so obviously when it comes to diversifying your leadership, and that's both your board, your senior leadership team, there are obviously always going to be the functional skills that you need to make sure you have around the table. But beyond this, it's thinking about what the board and leadership team is actually there for and what's going to make a difference. Because in our experience, talking to a range of boards and chairs and CEOs, what matters most to them is the curiosity, it's the judgment, it's the ability to identify and formulate a challenge or a question quickly and on your feet, really supportive. And the more different thinking you have around that table, the better the questions and the better the thinking you do between you. And it may make it less comfortable than it was, but the evidence all suggests that's a really good thing. And it's important to have people that can think from the outside, because who are the people you're not reaching? And those voices, how represented are they? So diversity isn't just something that informs the recruitment, the remit for your recruitment, those person specifications you put together for every role, be it a board or a member of the executive team, it flows out of your strategy. So you need to be thinking about what your strate strategic priorities are about diversity. What is it you're looking to do? Do you want to reach a wider audience? Are there sections of the community that don't engage for you? Are you changing what you do? How do these things impact what you need? Do you need people to give you credibility with a younger demographic, for example? Is it people who understand to feel what it's like to be outside your organisation? So then there's the kind of how you go about that. And the first really important thing is to make a plan. With boards, for example, you know when the board members are going to be coming to the end of their terms. So succession planning is really important. And making appointments in batches, in my experience, is always a good opportunity to increase the diversity around the board table because you're looking for complementary skills and not trying to fit every single thing into one person. And executive level, this is still relative. What does the current makeup of the team look like? What does the talent pipeline in the organisation look like? What are you building for the future? So secondly, then it's the mandates. And again, what you need falls out from that strategic plan. What are you looking to be as an organisation in five years from now? And what's the journey to get there? What specifics might you need around holding to account or challenge or support? So, for example, you might have digital challenges. You might have new services that you're going to do, new buildings. What does that mean then for what might be useful for you? Another piece that a lot of people um, don't always do is actually talking to someone outside of their organisation, maybe in a slightly larger one, that's a better step away from your sector. Can it, it can challenge some of your thinking and perhaps sometimes inject some realism into that. And another way to do that is to bring someone like that into your recruitment panel as well, which I'll come on to. So then when you come thinking about the skills and experiences you need, think about what that means and what level. Organisations rightly like to be ambitious, but it's not unusual for our clients, for example, to say we're looking for a chair of our audit and risk committee and they really need to be a CFO of a FTSE 100 business. We hear that a lot. But how relevant is that really to what you're trying to achieve? Is that really as necessary? Is that the only place to find those skills? Again, do your candidates need that prior experience in your sector or at already be operating at that leadership level or been on a board? And why is that? What else in their background could equip them with those skills that they could bring and it's transferable? And then it's about the vision itself for why people would want to join you. Don't gloss over the things that look difficult. If there's a lot of change, if there's a painful restructure, if the finances are challenging, be positive, but be honest, because there are people out there that will want that challenge. And if they're not, they're probably not going to be right anyway. So then it's the questions. What language are you using in your, in your, in your recruitment documents? Is it coming across as macho? Is it very traditional? Is it about leadership or is it about teams? And we do find actually that we suggest don't using that terminology around we welcome applications from all sections of the community or similar. The research has suggested that that actually can actively put people off because it's a statement rather than a commitment. So we'd like to work with you in exploring the blockers. So thinking about it, are there features of the role which make it, make it harder for you to reach beyond those usual suspects? 
So considering in that, when you're putting your documents together, like candidate pack or microsize or however you do it, what images are you using to represent your organization? How much are you showing of, of, of yourselves as a diverse organization? Are you including information on your EDI strategy and what the organization is already doing? Because people are going to want to see that. If you want to increase the leadership, uh, the diversity around your leadership table, then people need to see why you would be the organization that they should commit that to. So again, in the person specification, a broader set of skills, opening it up to another level of experience, opening up to people's experience being in a transferable sector, not just in the same space. We find it really helpful to look at values-based questions for the application. So instead of a traditional supporting statement, what we do is working with you on a set of questions that are really tailored to your values and some of the strategic challenges, and you ask candidates to address those directly. Practically, do you want to consider a blind application process? Be Applied, for example, is a platform where you put all of the answers in, you only see candidate responses, you don't see the name or the organisation or a CV until people have gone through that stage. That can be useful for some. So then it's about how you find people. And people have talked about this already, building that pipeline, not just within your organisation, though. Have coffee with loads of people. Talk to the best connected people you know and ask them who you should be speaking to. Constantly be thinking about where that could be. Your own networks, people who attend your events, your audiences, your residents, your members, people who may have actually ideas and thoughts that you could just bring into that. And then how you test people once they get through that process. Hold on to your mandate and test them against your priorities. I'd suggest you designate a member of your nominations committee as your, your accountability champion, so you don't lose sight of the original vision, or even an independent person who's outside of your organization that plays that role for you and provides that throughout the process. Really important to think about how you include residents or service users as a part of that process, because it helps keep the appointments really close to what you need, remembering what people want, having them as a stakeholder panel, maybe some informal chats, their feedback can really inform some of those. And the last thing is to really try never to slip it slip back into deficit thinking. You know, asset based, positive language in abundance. If you started out your process saying we want people with fresh perspectives who are active on the front line, for example, don't shift that to they don't have as much experience. They've not quite had that board level. If you want people who are from communities that don't typically engage with you, well, then all the emphasis on they've always been committed to your particular organisation isn't going to cut it either. So those are kind of just a few things to think about. And I hope that's given a bit of a sense of just some of the steps to be thinking about before you even start the recruitment.